welcome to another episode of Hashtag Disruption Dialogues, a markets and markets podcast series for growth-minded strategy, market intelligence, and competitive intelligence professionals. Today, our host Pranjal Sharma is in discussion with Vishwamitra Nandlal, VP Technology Strategy and Ecosystems at Dell Technologies. Hello and welcome to another episode of Disruption Dialogues. I'm Pranjal Sharma. I'm an author based in New Delhi. And I'm in discussion with Vish Nandlal. Thanks, Vish, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Vish, we're going to be talking about a subject called Edge AI. And I think that's a lot of depth in these two little words. So the question is to get to understand it for us and also to uh, get a sense from you about uh, what this is and where this is headed. So can you give us a sense of, one has heard of edge computing and everybody knows uh, artificial intelligence and its various applications, but when you put them together, what does it mean? Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's like uh, what's happening in the internet today. We're seeing a structure that's, that's largely centralized. That there's a lot of pooled servers that form the heart of the internet. And they've been built by companies like Google and Amazon. And uh, that internet has served, for the most part, many of the applications that you know, consumers enjoy today. What's happening next in the internet is really a, a scaling in space and time. So we're trying to change the topology of the internet to move computing closer to end users. And the uh, idea is that by doing this, we'll be able to create experiences that aren't um, going to demonstrate the same types of latencies and response times that you would if I have to go all the way back down to a centralized server in the middle of Arizona. So that's the logic behind and the simple principle behind edge computing. You know, when I think of AI, the co-evolution of edge and AI is um, obviously a great intersection to study in that AI has delivered a tremendous amount of um, new optimization capabilities and given us the, the ability to recognize images and um, understand and parse speech. What we're finding is that as it evolves, much of the production level kind of capabilities and assurances that we want in AI are lacking in centralized compute environments. Um, some of it has to do with privacy where you have regimes like GDPR, where certain data has to stay within a certain geography. Some of it has to do with the volume of data that's getting transmitted. So imagine if you're running AI on a many, many different video images, the amount of bandwidth that's going to require to transport that all the way back to a centralized cloud is staggering and could be quite costly. So being able to do that on a local uh, node that's closer to the source is obviously the ideal environment for that particular application to be deployed. Can you kind of uh, I mean, share an example of how this would work? I mean, what would be a good example of this? Yeah, I think I think there's two examples that are, are worthwhile noting. There's the content delivery networks that have really created a, a consolidation within the internet. Content delivery networks from companies like CloudFront and, and Akamai you know, should be fairly well understood by most of the listeners here. They're they're kind of the original edges. And the whole idea was it takes a long time for a video to get delivered from a distant point in the internet. So let's try to move delivery points closer to end users. And that evolved the whole internet architecture and really reduced the amount of hops that a user had to transit before they got to content. And in fact, today, most content is served at your first point of presence. Um, I'd say greater than 80% of consumer traffic is served from there. So the internet has really, you know, structurally changed quite a bit because of the service delivery capability. Probably the more contemporary one is cloud gaming. And, you know, we've all heard the enthusiasm was, was Google Stadia launch that happened somewhere around 2019. That was really an opportunity to be able to leverage the power of centralized and pooled compute to reduce the cost of a um, particular consumer's terminal. So you didn't have to have this heavy powered video card that sat in your terminal. You could take a fairly cheap client and be able to get you know, 4K, 120 frames per second uh, gaming images delivered to you. I mean, that, that was the idea. That, that was definitely the hope. Now, what actually occurred was, turns out, you can't do that on centralized compute very easily. Most of the compute, for instance, in Google's data centers, that was built to deliver Gmail and YouTube and other Google-built applications. When it comes to video rendering, it turns out that's not as useful. 
And so what we're finding is that the way cloud gaming is actually going to start to materialize is by leveraging this new edge compute capability. And that'll help to uh, deliver the types of latency resources, but it's also gonna require a rethinking of how we build the hardware as well so that it has enough compute power. So from what I understand, edge is mostly about reducing the latency. Then what role does AI have? How does AI complement this ability of edge? There's a couple of probably uh, poster child applications that tend to canonize what are the key applications that are going to be used when um, you're uh, you're at the edge. The first is what we call a private edge. Um, worst deployed, bought by a, a company, an enterprise of some kind. And um, it would be used in, for instance, doing you know, defect detection on a factory line um, where you'll have a camera that's observing uh, the output of a particular factory line and it's examining for defects. It's taking a look at um, you know, whether or not there's, there's breakage, there's a bad solder joint or, or whatever the defect is, the system that you would have with an edge and a, a video monitor would um, run an AI algorithm where it's doing image detection for particular defects and it would flag them. And that gives you the ability to react and create interventions to correct the failure rate on that particular production line. So this has you know massive consequences for obviously manufacturing and factories, but uh, that that's kind of where um, a lot of the, the, the ideas around AI took root. It was this ability to be able to inspect the real world and bring that insight into the digital world where a decision could be made. Um, and that boundary uh, is best served in many ways through AI uh, because it's meant to try to emulate the types of discrimination um, in terms of a, a good object and a bad object that a human could be able to apply. Uh, and we use an AI to you know substitute for that to do it at scale. So Vish, you know, when, when you talk to at Dell, when you talk to your clients about such solutions, what is it that business leaders and decision makers need to understand about how and when to deploy this combination of two very powerful engines? I'm sure there are many use cases, but and, and the, the applications could be as, as diverse as the industries. But in your conversations and the solutions that, that Dell is offering, is there something that Dell is pushing ahead uh, and is, is trying to convince the industry on? W what is Dell's pitch on this? Yeah, you know, Dell is obviously an infrastructure provider. We um, believe that we're developing all ports of the portfolio that are required for performance. And um, at the end of the day, Edge is going to be the place where much of the compute in the world is going to take place. This evolution uh, has been happening for years, and um, we're seeing that uh, starting to hit the commercial markets in real time. So the, the time scale isn't 30 years from now, it's, it's really now that this is occurring. The, the big enabler that Edge brings into the enterprise is that ability to cross the IT and OT boundary. And, you know, if I think about where the complaints in terms of technology has been at a, you know, at a UN level, let's say, it's been, where is the productivity gains? There's been a, a you know, tremendous uh, disparity over the past 20 years in terms of productivity growth due to technology, despite the fact that technology is ever present. The opportunity, I think, is that we can unshackle a lot of these new tools that are being built as denizens of the digital world and extend them into the physical world. And when you cross that boundary, that's where real productivity gains are gonna be had because obviously we live in the real world. So operational technologies is really the key towards this business transformation, this digital transformation of businesses, um, where they can automate things at scale. That's where a lot of the enterprises that we've spoken to are, are very excited about um, Edge. And obviously Dell is going to kind of really spend a lot of time looking to you know understand how do we build that out and how do we scale it for performance. If I think of where traditional clouds have come from, it's all about everything's the same. You know, we want homogenous servers so that I can manage them at scale. And we're going to create economic efficiencies by pooling them. Edge is very different. We're not working with homogenous servers. We're trying to 
optimized for performance. As it's distributed, the compute isn't limitless, it's limited. And so we really need to pack a lot of punch in each of these edge servers. So as we kind of flip that way of thinking about how we deploy compute, Dell is trying to make that transition with our enterprise customers to educate them about how do you optimize for those edge environments. Vish, are there any highlights of the solutions that you've provided for some of your clients and enterprises that you would like to, to share with us? in terms of what it could mean for others too? Yeah, you know, one of the more compelling use cases that we've seen is around this phenomenon of digital twin. So I'm throwing another interesting term into the mix here. And digital twin, you can think of it as a bit of a precursor to the metaverse, where the metaverse is this, you know, immersive reality that we're all trying to inhabit and hopefully transacting, put commercial structures in place. That's some ways into the future. How do we get to metaverse. One way is to start modeling the real world in the digital world and to create a twin, if you will, of a particular asset. Think of maybe a John Deere tractor that's sitting in a precision agriculture farm where that John Deere tractor is giving information about soil content and which fields have been tilled uh, and other topographical information that can help a farmer to understand you know, where all of his, his plantings are and his seeds are. So. How do we build that picture of that tractor? You know, we may want to understand whether or not there's certain failure modes that will take that tractor down and create outages for that farmer in terms of productivity and output so that we can be predictive about the maintenance. That's a, a big area that Digital Twin has tried to solve. It's how can we bring some of the predictive insights that we enjoy through AI into this real world um, system that would require a mechanic to check every hour to get the same level of accuracy as the digital twin model would by continuously evaluating it. So that's the kind of opportunity that we're seeing. It's not just applicable to one industry. You could apply this uh, all the way across the board. Um, so it's not one of those things where it's unevenly spread in terms of demand. It's fairly evenly spread across many different industries. So th this is an area where it really requires you know, the ensemble effort of the network, the edge compute capabilities, the AI application stack that sits on top, all the work and power together in order to deliver these outcomes. A digital twin is an excellent example, Vish, because uh, it, it is finding now applications across sectors. So while you refer to the tractors and automotive, but there's, you know, it is, it's happening in aerospace manufacturing of engines, but it's also now getting a lot of attention in healthcare because digital twins of humans and several specific organs are being created to, to be able to improve diagnosis and, and to get into testing uh, of various uh, medicines as well. So it seems to me that something like this is, it could be a way interesting but customizable kind of solution which which can uh, be applied to nearly all sectors i mean it, do you see the interest coming from all sectors equally or do you think that some sectors are ahead of others in the deployment and uh, absorption yeah i don't see all sectors adopting it evenly it is uneven in terms of adoption i think the demand is even and that all sectors understand um, that it can deliver substantial capabilities. When we think of digital twin, just like terms like IoT and even edge, you know, th these are terms that are used to convey really a, a, a mental model of how something could be designed and deliver a solution. But it represents so many different things that it can be you know, a little bewildering in terms of what precisely is someone talking about. The areas that digital twin have really kind of taken root has been in traditional product lifecycle management technologies. Um, so the early PLM areas where we're, we're taking CAD designs, putting them in libraries, and then you know doing engineering changes to those over time as it's sitting through its lifecycle as a product inside a customer domain. That's where it came out of. And so what we find are the early adopters of digital twin tend to be in that vein. It's, for instance, you know the GEs of the world who developed uh, large wind turbines that they need to monitor to provide maintenance guarantees to in terms of downtime SLAs that they're signing up to. That tends to be where the origins of Digital Twin come from. 
that tends to be very complicated and you're talking about an asset class that's you know tens of millions of dollars where digital twin is moving to is to be able to cover you know asset classes that are maybe tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars and to do it at scale um, and that's where you know we're going to see this whole market start to widen you'll have a digital twin of a quick service restaurant you might have a digital twin of a supply chain which is you know popular right now in terms of being able to visualize things and to anticipate changes because of things like covid and you know that when we take a look at the, the lockdowns and the impact that that has had on global supply chains you know the ability to anticipate that becomes very important and digital twin um can provide you know quite a bit of insights in terms of how to navigate that so we're, we're seeing it applied to processes we're seeing it applied to buildings for information building management systems in the retail space for real estate where people can take virtual tours of a home that that's typically delivered leveraging digital twin like design patterns so there's a whole you know continuum of digital twin capabilities uh, that can that can be tailored for each of these different industries so which you know when you say that uh, you know edge computing and then the stack of ai on top of that now when you look at a solution uh, that you would offer to your client would that be completely run by dell or would you have to work with partners and create an ecosystem for delivering that solution because it seems to me that it's pretty huge it, i don't know whether it's it's possible uh, for one company to deliver like yours or how would it operate in in real world yeah i think you're hitting on a very important principle in any technology it's that the technology itself the primary technology can't get adopted until there's a lot of complementary technologies in place um, and it's that co-evolution that really starts to drive adoption over time when we think about how things get delivered at the beginning when those complements don't exist usually a managed service helps in terms of creating a motion where the business really just wants an outcome um, they don't really want edge or ai or digital twin they want to increase productivity of their factory um, and they've got real reasons for wanting to do that because maybe they have the limited space and they need to get higher yields um, and so there is some return on investment that they calculate that they then are asking for someone to provide they don't want the edge they don't want the ai they want the ensemble of everything to deliver that outcome and so doing it as a managed service really reduces the complexity of trying to pull all those pieces together build it and then operate it so managed service tends to work very good at the beginning of a cycle what we're finding is that it does turn out that a lot of um, enterprises are looking for managed service delivery motions now there's always going to be the, the very large scale enterprises who want to roll their own, who've invested in research and development, who have their own applications and their own orchestration capabilities. And they're looking at building a bespoke system. And that will always be the case. But I think as we move away from, you know, let's say the, the Fortune 50, Fortune 100, and you move into the SMB space, you know, that's where this um, opportunity to deliver things as a service or as a managed service, depending on flavor of platform you're talking about. I think that's where we're going to hit critical mass. Yeah, I'm going to extract two points that you made and combine them. One, you talked about return on investment uh, and the effort. And second, uh, you talked about the objective. And I think that's the two crucial things because uh, a company doesn't really care about what technology you use as long as you deliver the solution to a problem statement and you do it at the least cost and highest uh, you know return on effort kind of basis on these counts uh, is edge ai computing is it going to score high on both these fronts yeah i think we're early in the deployments I think what's happened is most of the edge AI deployments that are out there are trials and experiments. Um, many enterprises have not expanded those across their network. They've taken limited use cases to validate, to your point, is the return going to be worth it? <laughs> is, the, is the squeeze worth the juice, if you will? And what they're finding is that, yes, it, it is worth it. As you go through the motion of scaling it, that's where you start to get some instabilities because we still have early learnings in terms of how to manage these things usually you know you, you kind of go from 
a practice to good practice to best practice. We're in the practice phase. We haven't hit best practices as yet. And so that ability to deploy something in production at scale is where we are in terms of the learning cycle for Edge. And those will come. We are learning about how to manage massive distributed systems at the Edge. And we're learning about the security that needs to be in place in order to lock them down efficiently enough so that you don't have leakage at scale. Um, and that's a particular concern for many enterprises, but they're still evolving. And so I think that's that's where the limiting factor is right now in terms of adoption. But wish uh, from what one knows and has seen, uh, this evolution curve is pretty rapid, sometimes faster than the speed of light, right? So from right. practice to best practice could be maybe a few weeks, uh, if not less. That's right. That's right. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing in technologies that uh, are exponential and humans usually don't have good insight for exponents. Um, you know, they may take some level of uh, complacency in the beginning and not realize that, okay, well, at the 50% mark uh, in a 100-day cycle, the, the next day you're almost at 90% penetration and, and, you know, things start to become a little bit more urgent in terms of your ability to step up. So finally, Vish, you know, uh, this is fascinating. And even the new terms that I'm learning and I think our listeners have heard uh, is, is quite fascinating. But tell us a little bit about your role and how do you see, you know, what is the kind of work that you have done in Edge AI? Because as a domain expert, I'm sure you find some of these concepts fascinating and you're probably uh, cracking some of the tough nuts uh, within the ecosystem. I have a, a lot of personal passion for edge and AI. A lot of it has to do with you know, where the internet is going. And I do think that, you know, if you if you go back to the old hierarchical internet that were taught in high school textbooks or maybe your university textbooks, depending on where you are, you know, it, it looks like this cascade that starts from these backbones to transit to your internet service provider. That is not what the internet looks like today. What's happened is the internet has become this very densely peered, what I would call horizontal network, as opposed to hierarchical. Uh, it's flattened considerably. And the reason it's flattened is that at the center of the internet, all of these hyperscale players came in and they introduced private backbones. They started to consume all of these transit networks. They brought content delivery networks at the heart of the internet. So the massive consolidation, both at a company buying another company basis, but also in the way that a lot of the internet infrastructure got sucked up into these hyperscalers, it changed the nature of you know, what the internet looks like. And if I look at today, you know, much of the internet is opaque. It's hidden because all of the, the dark arts of the internet is happening inside the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apples of the world. With Edge, we are actually have an opportunity to open up these networks again. So there's an opportunity to encircle the internet with this ring of Edge nodes. And that's going to allow us to intermediate a consumer with the internet, because all of our transactions will get relayed through these Edge devices. Now, what does that mean? This is actually quite interesting. When you're able to do that, I can start to build out a Tor network. So if you're not familiar with Tor, it's basically a network that ensures your privacy so that all of my transactions are now anonymous to this private internet that sits at the center. And that's a way for users to kind of claim and reclaim their privacy. And it can change the economic nature of how we monetize the internet. It could create a fairly large revolution over time. The other thing that it'll do is it allows us to start to rethink how internet rules are going to work. So how should addressing work? Should we use IP addresses, which are Byzantine to most people, or should we have a named network where, you know, today, if you go to Google, you're not going to a server called Google that's unique. Not all transactions go to it. You may be going to a mirror image of that site that's sitting in your, your internet service provider's data center. And so, you know, the uniqueness of that name is less of a thing as opposed to the service that it carries. And so if we can create an internet where I can just name the service and the network takes care of where to route it, that will be a massive new change again in being able to provide 
privacy, but also being able to engineer services that are more responsive to users. And so I, I really think that there is an opportunity here for us to, to rethink the nature of the internet with edge and AI. There's a lot of really cool work happening right now. People like Scott Schenker and others who are developing this concept called the extensible internet, which is all about how do we take all those hidden functions um, that used to be available to us in the hierarchical network, but now are hidden from us in this private network. How do we take all those hidden functions and expose them at the edge of the internet? And then take advantage of those to build an internet that's that's more egalitarian, that you know gives us access to the resources to effectively deliver services to other users. So it's a, it's quite an exciting time. I'm very enthusiastic and passionate about that change. This is uh, quite fascinating. I think uh, we may have stumbled upon another theme for our next uh, podcast. From what you are saying, uh, this is you know we started by talking about edge and AI coming together and we've spoke about digital twins and each of these is, is quite a fascinating uh, field of work and the way it's changing the way enterprises uh, work and deliver solutions. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us today. I think we would probably need to talk some more if we could talk for a couple of more hours on, on thoughts like these. But um, uh, thanks very much for, for being with us today. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks to everybody for listening uh, today. I was in conversation with Vishnan Lal, Vice President, Technology Strategy and Ecosystems at Dell Technologies. We'll be back with more such conversations in Disruption Dialogues. Please do subscribe and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Disruption Dialogues. If you are a strategy or market intelligence professional, we invite you to join our community on LinkedIn, Hashtag Disruption Dialogues.